In Ghana, everyone knows about trade. Everyone knows about markets. In a land of sunshine, everyone has something to sell. And yet, Ghana still relies on foreign aid for most of its national budget. Now the rich countries say it's time to change. Countries like Ghana must begin to trade their way out of poverty. It's one of the themes of this month's summit on sustainable development. So in this edition of Life, we've come to Ghana to find out how easy trading in the world marketplace really is. Our guide, top Ghanaian trade expert, Augustine Odongo of Phage. Phage stands for Federation of Ghanaian Exporters. It's a member-based organization. Our uniqueness derives from the fact that we are member-based. We deal directly with members in the field. And that is uh, our raison d'etre. Augustine's job is to help Ghanaian exporters. If anyone can help us understand their problems, it's Augustine. First stop, five hours north of Ghana's capital, Accra, one of Africa's biggest maize farms. Uh, we're going to a, a giraffe farms. Uh, this is one of the largest, if not the largest, maize farming set up in Ghana. The information that is available is, is, is that as a result of the import of maize, uh, especially for the animal feed industry, poultry in particular, they have had to hold up some stocks which they cannot offload on the local market because uh, they, they simply cannot compete with the, the price of imported maize. So, uh, what, what I hope we'll be able to see is have a discussion with they themselves, the managers and the workers themselves to see the full effect of this on them. Straight to the heart of the problem, even this huge farm can't compete with maize from countries like the United States that subsidize their farmers. Some of the stocks in these silos are held for the National Reserve, but mostly they just can't sell it. Understand you have quite a stockpile of maize up there in the greenery. At this time of the year, you should be uploading this grain to make room for new maize coming in. Really? So why are you still keeping this? We are not getting the market for it. Just because um, the government has allowed um, certain industries to import the maize, to put the foreign maize to the country. Now what is the problem with foreign maize coming to the country? Does that create any problems for it the local problem. yes, producers? Yes, the imported ones are cheaper. The imported maize is cheaper? Yes. But since our uh, cost of production is high, we cannot sell our maize at a very cheap price. Your cost of production is higher? Uh, yes, in terms of the fertilizer, inputs like fertilizer, uh, chemicals like uh, herbicides, the labor, and so on. Who do you normally sell your maize to? We used to sell to the poultry industries. The poultry industry? Yes, yes. they are the major consumption of the... Yeah, your the, major, the major consumers of, of your, the maize. Of the maize? Yes. Okay. And now, if they have access to cheaper imports, yes. They won't come to us. They won't come to you. Yes. So what then do you do with the maize that you would, you would be holding in stock, which the the we wait until the, the until the price come, goes up. Until the price goes up. Yes. Okay. And there's another reason the farm's maize is more expensive. We've taken a look round, and generally it appears your equipment is old. Yes. Is there any any problem with keeping old equipment? Why are you not replacing it? I think it's all brought to one point, a financial problem. Financial problem? Yes. What of your own uh, income levels? Generally, yes. the income levels here are quite low. Since we are not getting low, um, we cannot um, go to the management and then make unnecessary demands. You see. No unnecessary demands. These workers on under a dollar a day know the management can't afford to pay more. Countries that face unfair competition can appeal to the World Trade Organization, but subsidies to crops like maize are within its rules. Next stop, the local town of Kumazi and one of the maize farm's customers, poultry plant Darko Farms. Uh, we're now going to Darko Farms. Uh, Darko Farms is one of the large poultry farms in Ghana. We're going out to confirm the story that we heard at um, Ejra farms about the impact of imported maize. Because as Ejra farms, people told us, uh, Daco farms are one of their major buyers. But the Ejra farms, people also explain that uh, now they've stopped buying from them because they are buying the imported one, which is cheaper in terms of price. 
So we want to find out if this is true. What Augustine discovers, the plant hasn't cancelled its orders, but has cut back on expensive local maize, because it's also facing competition from cheap foreign imports. And we do import yellow maize, but that does not mean we have stopped buying from them because that's the reason. But we do import yellow maize um, from time to time for about three years now, I think we've imported. Um, when the prices are higher, we bring in the maize to give us a lower cost of production so that we can compete with the um, imported chicken out there. Um, because the price the imported chicken arrives over here is a relatively low compared to what is being produced. So um, with a higher cost of production, you can't really compete with the um, imported um, chicken. So you, you'd, you'd put the high cost of production here uh, as the main cause of the, the high prices that you are offering to the consumer? Uh, relatively, yeah, the high cost of production, but I also looked at it from this angle that the goods coming from there, um, the maize or whatever has been subsidized, which is a lower cost for them to produce over there. So if you don't have that thing relatively here, you're, not go you're going to run into that problem. If they can't compete with cheap imports in their own markets, not much chance of Ghana's farmers selling abroad, no matter how tasty and well cared for the product. But cheap imports aren't the only challenge. Next stop, a banana plantation in the central lakes region of Ghana. Where, where did this come from? From the plantation. From the plantation. Yes. Then the selection process begins. Volta River Estates export to the EU, to Europe. Their problem, trying to comply with the EU's licensing rules. Alex, you have quite a, a good setup here, um, and you export to Europe. Have you had any problems exporting to Europe? Indeed, there is. Uh, you know, we still have to overcome this uh, uh, European Union license uh, system on uh, uh, banana. Can you, can you explain that further? What is this licensing system? Well, you know that I'm not, I'm not a technical man, but what it means to me as a farmer is that we are not able to get our export into the market. Washing the crop is easy enough. So is spraying it with chemical preservatives. And the spray is meant to preserve the fruit. What's harder is meeting EU licensing requirements like length and weight. That means using lots of chemical fertilizers, expensive, and not the kind of farming they like around here. I think that the idea of uh, length and sizes in bananas are just an exaggeration of the actual matter because to make your bananas grow big in size and in length, all that you have to do is to dump a lot of chemical fertilizer and in the next couple of months you have your big length, your big sizes and then your length. But we talk about fair trade and fair trade has to deal with the environment and therefore uh, natural uh, growing things is what comes into mind. You think about consumer choice. So we as a fair trade company, we believe that we have to grow our bananas in a more sustainable way. So in future, they'd like to go organic, if consumers will pay. Meantime, licensing rules and ever-changing quotas constitute for Augustine a serious non-tariff barrier. Not exactly a tax, but still a restriction on trade. For somebody like me who is in trade advocacy, that appears to be another barrier to trade. They're closing the doors on, on us. They're opening the doors with one hand, saying we are doing away with quotas, we are removing or reducing taxes, import duties, tariffs, and so on. Meanwhile, with the other hand, they are closing the door by bringing in quality requirements that are far beyond the capacity of local producers, especially the small-scale producers. Here, I wouldn't buy a banana using a tape to measure. The farmer, when he's growing it, hasn't got a tape to be measuring. But if that's what Europe is requiring, then Europe has to make an effort to help us to understand them and help us to be able to develop our capacity up to the level that we'll be able to meet each, each other halfway. The Ghana is still largely a rural and agricultural based economy. About 70% of our people end their living in uh, agricultural activity. And part of this, the more, the more paying part of agricultural activity is that which is committed to exports. So if as a result of the increasing quality requirements by Europe, we lose out on our agricultural exports. 
And what it means is that those who are currently engaged in agricultural exports are going to lose their jobs. After all this, you might be forgiven for wondering how Ghana's farmers can ever export at all. But time for a success story, and so we drive through the south of Ghana to Tema. Athena Foods makes pineapple juice. It's also had problems with non-tariff barriers, but its canny US-trained manager found a way around them. So one local producer who has captured a thriving export market. But tell me, you've been doing exports to Europe for quite some time now, uh, more than a year, more than two years. Have you had any problems meeting the EU requirements, EU regulations and so on? Uh, yes. What, what exactly is the problem? Uh, when we started, the, the product was pretty good. The fruits, the analysis in Germany came out very well. And it was so good that uh, one buyer was actually using it uh, for baby food formulation. Then we ran out of fruits, went to Ivory Coast. And um, with the concentrates that we made from those fruits, they had high ethylene residues on them. This is the name of a chemical? Yes, it is and a chemical. The EU has a regulation on the amount of residue yes. of this chemical that can be allowed on, on a fruit or on the, the extract of the fruit. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. How did you overcome this problem? Uh, we tried working with the Ghana Standards Ghana Board. Ghana Standards okay. Board. Uh, mm -hmm. They didn't even have the mechanism to analyze it. Then we realized that uh, we had a big problem on our hands. Uh, while trying to resolve it, we, we took what one may call an easy way out. We realized there was a market for organic juices. And uh, we started adapting our plant. Yeah. And this is what we did, and that's what we're exporting now. Uh, the EU is moving towards zero residue levels. The EU is moving towards organic. It turns out organic farming, at least with pineapple and some of the ve uh, vegetables that we, we grow and fruits that we process here, uh, the farming conditions are compatible with our rural farmers' uh, method of farming. So now the issue becomes, how do I encourage the rural farmers to grow more organic for me so that, I mean, I wouldn't have to worry about residue levels, just satisfy the conditions of organic uh, uh, fruits, organic uh, production. Then I should have no problem with uh, EU because I will be at where EU is trying to get. Next stop, another success story, Farmer Pine on the outskirts of the capital Accra, a cooperative that helps farmers produce those tasty organic fruit. Essentially, Farmer Pine is, is a cooperative of farmers, small-scale farmers and, and exporters. What, what, again, what we do is uh, we supply the farmers with inputs to produce a quality, an ideal quality pineapples. But I think if you produce a better pineapple quality, it pays. Yes, we are getting more money. At the same time, we are producing more. We are expanding our farms. But, oh dear, there's another problem. The globalised world market is fickle. Now the farmers are producing and producing and producing. And uh, our share in the market is such that at times you have the fruit, but then the buyers will tell you, don't bring it. These are some of the things. You see, mm -hmm. yes, uh, sometimes they will, they will ask you to bring uh, maybe uh, 40 tons of pineapple, then at the last moment they will tell you, I will need only 20 tons. You see, meanwhile you have already made allocation for all these things. So this will be left out and you will pay for it. Why, why are they behaving like this? Why are they, they, the buyers behaving this way? They will ask you for two tons and eventually take only one ton. Yeah, I think there are competition, there are competition. So where you have these multinationals, uh, when they flood the market, you are nowhere. So I think that has been the problem. Boats against the current, Ghana seeing its future in exporting, but somehow born ceaselessly back into the past, a past of poverty and rules that always seem loaded against it. Time for life to take a tour of its own, to find out why. 
and to find out if the people who make and think about the rules of the World Trade Game have any answers. First, Washington, where the World Bank has become an advocate of sustainable development through what it calls fairer trade. I think there's no doubt, and I've advocated for a long time, that the trade issue is central. Uh, also, the proportion of money that the developed countries are putting into trade barriers so outweighs the amount of money that they're putting into uh, overseas development assistance that you only have to hear the numbers to know that you have to get the two together. In trade, uh, for example, uh, the developed countries spend on subsidies for agriculture $350 billion a year. That's a billion dollars a day. And the amount of money put into overseas development assistance is $50 billion a year. So you've got seven times the amount of money that is going for development going into just one aspect of inhibition of trade. What we want is for developing countries and the people in them to have a chance to work their own way out of poverty. And if you give them a chance to manufacture and grow, but then deny them market access, uh, then you're hypocritical. Princeton, New Jersey, Ivy League America. On campuses across the world, some anti-globalization protesters argue free trade harms development. Remember those cheap imports. So we ask Princeton's world-famous trade guru if free trade is the friend or enemy of sustainable development. It's not exactly a friend or an enemy. Uh, it's to the extent that it leads to economic growth, it leads to some environmental pressures. Uh, to the extent that it leads to economic growth, it makes countries richer and more able to deal with their environmental problems. And uh, it's certainly, I think if you look on balance, it's not, it's not a negative, it's, it's a slight positive. How do you, what do you make of the critique of the anti-globalization movement and the, the notion that uh, we should have uh, instead of having um, freer trade, we should have more self-sufficiency in developing countries. I guess I wonder if they remember what the world was like uh, 25 years ago. See, my, my, I'm, I'm pro-globalization, and ultimately the reason I'm pro-globalization is I remember the utter hopelessness that we used to feel about developing countries. And we used to say that developing countries was a, you know, that was a joke, because developing countries meant countries that don't develop. Uh, and we've had successes since then, not across the board, not everywhere, not everything you want. But we've had some successes, and all of the successes are associated with freer trade, with growing exports. Um, and I just don't think, I think these people are romanticizing what it was like before this, this move towards globalization. But can we really have free trade that would help not just the rich old world, but developing countries too? Last stop on our tour, Brussels from where the EU administers its subsidies and non-tariff barriers. So how does it defend them? If you take your example of Ghana, uh, Ghana has, in terms of tariff barriers, 100% free access to the European Union. So no tariff barriers. But, as you say, uh, we have a number of technical barriers. I mean, they're called sort of non-tariff barriers sanitary rules, uh, phytosanitary rules, uh, which prevent, for instance, uh, flowers uh, uh, where the sort of minimum pesticide residue which we have in order to protect health in the European Union is not matched. Now, what, what can we do? What we can do is what we did with Kenya on flowers. We've helped Kenya, we've done the necessary transfer of know-how, and now Kenya exports flowers into directly into uh, English or French or Belgium retail stores because we've provided them with the necessary laboratories. So it is possible and we are concentrating our development, our technical assistance, our development aid onto things like that. But of course the small farmer uh, needs to sort of have access to this testing hub and this is back to the local governance problem. They have to organize themselves so that if they produce flowers, they can go to this laboratory and there will be five or six of these for Ghana and then it will work. Doesn't the fact that EU nations and the rich countries generally subsidize their own farmers and agriculture to the tune of billions of dollars a year stop the developing nations trading their way out of poverty by selling their own farming products? It's not very fair to compare, I mean, sort of social policies 
with development policies. I mean, one could also say that we spend hundreds of billions of euros on social security. Yes, we do that. But does this, does this have to be compared? The real point is not about the amount of subsidies. The real point is about whether what we do is trade distorting for developing countries. And we believe we need to support our farmers. I mean, we only have sort of seven million farmers left in the European Union, which is not much, and uh, we prefer to keep them for reasons which have to do with our way of life. So how, how can we do that without creating obstacles to trade to developing countries? That's the real issue. And these uh, old debates were, I mean, sort of 50 years ago was uh, aid, not trade. Uh, I mean, 10 years ago was trade, not aid. I think it's definitively trade and aid for the next 10 years to come. Back in Ghana, Augustine's last stop on the shores of Lake Volta. Ghana's big, beautiful lakes and rivers are still full of fish. A time-honored way of preserving the catch is to smoke it, also a way of adding value for export markets. But those non-tariff barriers are a problem again. Local people tried to meet the EU's hygiene and quality rules, but the EU made the rules for smoked fish even tighter as Augustine showed us up on the hillside. This, this facility was started in 1997 and completed in 1998. And it was meant to help the women who smoke fish here to come together, to come on the one roof. Uh, because as uh, you probably have seen in the, in the market where they are doing the smoking, they have the traditional method of smoking. There are three problems with that one. First of all, it wastes fuel because they are using the logs to do the, the smoking. Secondly, there's no consistency in the dryness of the fish and they smoke it differently. One woman does it in one place, another woman does it in another place. But for export, you need some amount of consistency and also in the size of the fish. So the exporters decided that they would put up this facility and help the women to select the fishes of a certain size, come and smoke it to a standard, uh, let's say, standard grade, all of them together, then they would have the consistency. This whole facility that is standing here now, small as it may look to somebody else elsewhere, took a lot of commitment on the part of the association, the exporters. They had to put in their own resources to put up this facility. They wanted a setup where anybody who comes in can see that there's the minimum hygienic conditions. And then the EU raised the standards even far above what they had set out to achieve. And therefore they had to abandon the whole, the whole exercise. For the women here, the consequences are, have been more disastrous. Unfortunately, because the exporters, the numbers have gone down, that means less fish is being shipped out from here. Therefore, income levels have also gone down. There's no doubt that it is an unfair situation. The first thing that you can do when you are faced with an unfair situation is to complain and just sit back and say this is an unfair situation. The second thing is to complain and appeal to the conscience of those who are creating an unfair situation to reverse the situation. People like to call that, please level the playing field. The third option, which we are committed to, is to find ways to be able to build alliances between us here and whoever has an interest, our interest in mind at the other end, to be able to take these issues up. So we find a way to meet the requirements halfway, then we can appeal to other people to also meet us halfway. That is where organization comes in. And when we say organization, I don't expect, or we don't expect the women here to buy themselves, spontaneously organize themselves. That's the work of people like me, people in my organization and similar organization. Those of us who like to call ourselves as being in the development industry, we have to make a commitment to organize our people, to help them to understand the way the market operates today, to help them to understand how the world works today, to help them to know that just by their own efforts, organized effort, will be able to overcome some of these obstacles. And part of the work that we do in FAGE and in our associations is to galvanize the women to come together because we've realized that part of the problem that we have in Africa in the third world generally is that if we want to keep up with the standards then we need to do some more organizational work. We need, as we like to put it, to become smarter. Uh, we do have a lot of hard work in Africa. We do have a lot of hard work in the third world. 
where the world is moving to generally now is towards smart work. So it's not just a, a matter of pushing and pushing and pushing and digging deeper and deeper into the same hole. We're finding a smarter way to be able to do things. In fact, I, I, I believe, and we have the strong commitment to this, that in a couple of years' time, one year, two years' time, would have a facility standing here that can be the EU requirements and anybody else's requirements for that matter. Augustine believes that, given help, the fish smokers of Lake Volta and many other agricultural producers in the developing world can compete in the globalized market.